Well, everyone, if you can't hear us, ask us to speak up. Um, we, we were going to plug it into that little thing down there. And if you're listening to this on the podcast and you can't see what the little thing is, it's a little speaker. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so thank you for coming along. Um, can we have a quick show of hands of who's listened to PodClash before? Okay, so you know what you're in for. For everyone that, for, for everyone that hasn't, um, just take a little minute to go over what we do. So Phil and I, were, well, actually all three of us were at the Rio Olympic Games. Um, I won a gold and silver medal. Do I won a gold? Just about. <laughs> uh, and Phil won a gold as well, doing, doing the thing he does, which is the best man won in the world. And basically we chat to different athletes from different sports. So we've had um, mainly cyclists, but we've had big wave surfers on... CrossFit, who else? Uh, canoeing. Yeah. Um, yeah, like many sports. Weight, weightlifting. <laughs> weightlifting. weightlifting yeah. I'm not even on the podcast, but I know yeah. more than you, Phil. <laughs> we haven't, we haven't introduced, well, I haven't introduced you. It's fine. You can speak. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically we think that if it's athletes talking to athletes, we, we bring something different to the table. Um, and the, the cycling podcast, who's up after this, I recommend that you go and see them. Um, but we're not in competition with them. That's very much an analytical breakdown, breakdown kind of piece about you know what's happened in the day's events we're not really like that for better or worse <laughs> um so first off i have to do a quick bit of commercial stuff try not to laugh because <laughs> i get really embarrassed every time i say it so um we're here for the whole week um as a pod crash pop-up we're based just down by the prince of wales roundabout and um, the bridge where you go into the fan zone if you pop down there you can get a free coffee um so thanks to our partners lamazoco north star roast and also temper a mattress like no other and if you put in <laughs> cycling100 to temper.co.uk, you can get £100 off a new temper mattress. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Um, so yeah, let's kick off the podcast. Uh, so Duel's actually probably our most frequent guest, so we went for the, the safer option of getting him on this one, basically. Um, so what do you think of the podcast so far, Duel? Yeah, I enjoy it. Um, as you were kind of explaining earlier, it's nothing like the cycling podcast, I think. The cycling posse actually have knowledge of cycling to start with. Um, and this is kind of a bit more off the hook, I guess. And kind of mm. just more of a conversation between friends. Um, and, you know, that's, that doesn't necessarily mean the podcast stays within the realms of cycling. You can end up talking about anything. So it's kind of more of a conversation. And the, yeah. the quick one, which I forgot to mention in the instruction, is that you might notice that Chris Lawless isn't here. Um, unfortunately, he couldn't make it this evening. Um, and we wish him all the best <laughs> in the future. Yeah. Um, but uh, Chris Lawless was one of your favourite episodes, wasn't it, Dool? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> what was it the agent said? Um, that boy should not be allowed to speak in public. <laughs> oh, you have, yeah, that's the thing with with all good podcasts. You have some good episodes and some bad episodes. Uh, so where does where does Lawless's fit in that category? I don't know. Phil's the one who does all the numbers. He's actually had decent views, you know, oh, yeah? or listeners, yeah. Well, yeah, there you go. Done all right. There you go. Mid table. But we've created some controversies over the past as well. So, is everyone familiar with uh, Dan Bingham the other day in the mixed team time trial? So, uh, he has some very differing views to a podcast that we did with you, Adam Blythe, and Chris Lawless about the use of Alo socks in the Peloton. So, I thought I'd just give you an opportunity now <laughs> to clear that up. <laughs> no, we're not I think the quote good. was Dan Bingham said, "You're at, you are an idiot if you don't wear Alo socks in the Peloton." Well, I wear aero socks, yeah. Oh, like, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, so you've changed your tune now? No, I've always worn aero socks. Oh, like, okay. I think it was on the most <laughs> live there. It's a deeper issue with all yeah. the, the British stuff, but we'll keep it light tonight. Yeah, <laughs> well, um, Adam Blythe, actually, good shout out to him, has got his own range of socks, which are not aero socks, but they do say aero socks on the side of them because he's very much against um, the introduction of any kind of aero wizardry <laughs> in the peloton, basically. Um, so have you been ke keeping up with the world champs so far? Yeah, I have. I've watched uh, pretty much every day so far. Um, it's been wet um, and the kind of the big thing I've taken from it is there seems to be a lot of mechanicals a lot of punctures on the course so whether that plays a factor for Sunday we'll find out a lot of puddles as well I saw a yeah. Danish guy hitting a puddle today didn't we yeah there was a there's a clip on uh, online I put it on my Instagram actually and uh, you got to love the guy's commitment he, there's literally must be I don't know a couple of feet of standing water and he goes into it at 60-70k an hour on, on his time to bike in the skis uh, it didn't end well for him. <laughs> has has, has, has everyone seen that video though? The middle of the road isn't actually that bad. I don't know why yeah. he just thought I'm going to take it. <laughs> the race middle. in line, mate. Race in line. Yeah. I think at one yeah. stage he's actually underwater. <laughs> <laughs> the first time someone ever drones in a cycling race. Um, but do you think, on a serious note, do you think it was a little bit too dangerous to be loading out today? 
Um, no, I think it was okay. I think you just have to be sensible and be aware of your surroundings. You know, a prime example is like this Danish guy just riding around the pedal. You know? <laughs> um, and I think it's with anything, especially with the time trial, when you're, when you're pushing and it's the world champs, you're going to be taking risks regardless. So whether it's a wet circuit, a dry circuit, there's always going to be incidents. Um, but obviously you're more prone to have them on a wet, twisty up and down circuit. Because there's a few people on Twitter saying that they thought it should have been stopped. So like Tony Gibb, uh, Lost Downing and all that kind of thing thought that it was over the edge. Have you ever been in some races that you've thought this really should be stopped? Yeah, yeah, a fair few, but it never happens. The show always goes on. Um, probably the one which sticks up most is Strade Bianchi last year. You know, it was like zero, two degrees, um, rain and snowing, racing on gravel roads, and it was just absolute chaos. Uh, but... Yeah, once once the race starts, it never really stops. And uh, so you're not someone that's ever jumped a lever crossing then? No. <laughs> Made a one-day classic? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, fair enough. Um, so I guess like before we move on to like what you've been up to recently, like what's your kind of memories of the World Championships? Because I think it's quite a special event, given that you get the under-23s and the younger age categories and the inclusion of Pala this year as well, kind of all being in the same boat together. Oh, for sure. I think that's one of the beauties of the of the worlds um, is that they incorporate all the categories. I remember my first ever world championships was in Copenhagen in 2011, so the year CAV won, and it was the first year where they included the junior categories into the whole event. Um, so that was pretty special. I still have memories of uh, doing the time trial and traveling to the start on the Team Sky bus because most of the time the national federations will lend, or the sorry, the pro teams will lend the national federations their buses um, because obviously not every national federation or barely any have a big bus so always with GB uh, it's Ineos and it used to be Sky would always lend the bus um, and then they allow the whole all the, the different squads and riders to use it so as a as an 18 year old getting to travel to the start of the junior world champs on the Sky bus sitting in maybe Brad C or Cav C you know um, it's pretty sp special and that was kind of yeah the overriding memory of just sitting on that bus and thinking well, this is what I'd like to be doing in the future. And mm. I never envisaged then eight years later that I'd be here riding the Elite Worlds, obviously riding for Ineos for a few years and Sky before that and kind of take that bus for granted now. So by, uh, <laughs> it's so like by an everyday occurrence. It's like <laughs> round, because the Ineos bus is here right now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah so the, the Ineos bus is down here with, with Chris Slark, our bus driver, Slarky. Does he uh, drive uh, the bus anywhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he, he drove... Has he, he ever driven it into a banner? No, he hasn't done a green edge. Oh, like, okay, good. Um, <laughs> no, we gave him a lot of her. We're allowed to swear on this podcast? What, when your coach broke his leg stepping out the bus? <laughs> what? When, oh. Oh, come yeah. On. <laughs> yeah, so um, basically uh, an, interesting an interesting kind of anecdote is that despite me and Phil being splinters, is that uh, our physiologist for the Leo Olympic Games now coaches Owen Duell. So that's a massive transition for, for the coach. But the funnier story behind that is that in his first week, working for Team Ineos. He was trying to take it super seriously. <laughs> he stepped out of the bus, went into a puddle, twisted his knee or ankle or something like ankle, that. Ankle, I think, yeah. And out of it for about a month or two after that. <laughs> so not, not as good a driver as anyone thinks, maybe. <laughs> Had to move it after that, I think. Um, but so when you were in the hotel and stuff like that, did you get to like chat to your idols and stuff like that? Or was it kept quite separate? Um, it is separate to a degree because at the end of the day, you know, especially in, uh, in Copenhagen, Obviously, most people know, obviously, Cav went on to win the race and there was the whole Project Rainbow behind that. So they were pretty dialed on stuff. Um, but, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the pro guys are really good with the younger guys, especially the under-23s, and will, you know, say hello or chat to you a bit, you know, at dinner. And um, I think it's, it's nice things like that. So it's, when I go to the, the race hotel here, you know, if I see one of the junior riders, you know, I'll chat to him in the lift or say hello, ask how their race is going, because you remember those little things as a junior and it's good to... It's just polite, I think, and it's a nice thing to do. You know, we are one team as GB, obviously. I don't know many of the, the younger guys racing, mm. but, you know, give it five, six years, they could be my teammates. You know, as a slightly interesting point, I actually heard all the juniors are getting shipped off before you get in that hotel. This time I learned. No, I go into the hotel tonight. Oh, right, so you're the exception. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, fair enough. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> um, and you've extended with Team Ineos quite recently as well. Yeah. Um, so can you, can you talk a little bit about why you choose to stay with the team? Because I'm sure you had other offers on the table, or maybe not. That would be embarrassing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically, what is it about Team Ineos, and why do you want to stay there? Um, yeah, so I've just signed another two years. So it would take me to five years with the team. Um, and for me, it's the best setup, I think, uh, I get a lot of freedom in the classics and opportunities to be able to race and learn there. Um, obviously, on the Grand Tour side of things, it's slightly more difficult. You know, it's taken me three years to, to get into my first Grand Tour, but 
Also, on the flip side of that, if you can make it into a Grand Tour team with Ineos, you you have to work for it and fight for it in, in it. Um, so, yeah, going forward, I feel it's the best place for me. I've got really great support um, from my coach. I got on with him really well. The team are really supportive. And this year has been a big step up for me. So I just want to continue that progression. And it's made logical sense. I think um, we all know that you've you've kind of stepped up massively this year, winning, uh, I can't pronounce this name of the classic. Can someone else say it? it? He didn't win it. So <laughs> I, no, I know, podium, that's close enough. <laughs> <laughs> so Bluge, Blu- Kern, 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 Okay, thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say the cycling podcast will offer a much better standard of journalism <laughs> okay. in the next room, in the next hour. Um, and then also you got your first slide in your Grand Tour. So what, what's been the key to you stepping up this year? Um... I don't think it's one specific thing across this year. It's it's a few things. Obviously, I, although last year wasn't as good, I still put a lot of work in. So it meant I went into this season in a lot better shape. Um, and just getting used to that consistent racing. You know, obviously, coming from a track background, especially the Rio Olympics, you know, we'll all testify. You, you know, you, you know you've only got to be good for one day. And obviously, you give your best for world championships, European championships. But the, the whole focus and everything you do is on the Olympics. Um, so on the track, yeah, you maybe race three, four times a year, and in that fourth year, you have the games, and that's your pinnacle. Whereas on the road, you're racing 70, 80 days a year. You know, I think, and this will be my 82nd race day on on Sunday at the World Champs, um, and that's a lot to, to to. It's hard to make that switch to, of having to be ready to race and being at a good level all the time when you come from that background of really peaking and tapering. So it took me a little while to get that consistency. And that's one big thing with the team is you have to be consistent so you can be relied upon in races. You know, if you're, if you're good for a couple of races in the year, you're never going to get into a Grand Tour team because is that if, you know. Um, if you could, you could do one stage race and be really good, the next one not be so great. And so they kind of think over three weeks, we need you consistent because most of the time we're going to be aiming to win these races and you need a team who could, you can support um, so yeah, that consistency takes a, a little while, or it did for me anyway. And the team is so competitive as well, isn't it? With like so many Grand Tour winners in the team, um, yeah. So it's even harder to make a Grand Tour team. Yeah, exactly. I think you know, as of next year, we'll have four Grand Tour winners in the team, um, and three of the last Tour de France champs. So to make a Grand Tour team next year is going to be difficult again, um, because you know I think they'll be aiming to try and do the triple next year with that kind of with that roster they have. So yeah, you always have that infighting, but I think it's the same as as what makes GB so successful. You know, we Can I all pick you up on the infighting point. Is it actually infighting, or is no, it not is in, it good? Not infighting. Stuff? You know, no, no one's like slapping each other for spots. You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, you know what I mean. It's the same mm. as GB. That's why GB in Australia tend to dominate on the track because they have such a great pool of riders. So you're always pushing. You know, you n- you never know. You go into the Olympics till about two weeks before usually because you're always fighting for those last few spots. And it just forces everyone to l- raise their game. You mm. see a few like, um, so like more of the kind of Maverick gliders, you can't ever really imagine them being in a, it, it seems from the outside looking in anyway, that Team Ineos is so structured and kind of strict almost. Um, is that something that you find quite an easy transition coming from the GB team? Or do you understand why some gliders kind of fail to make that transition? I'm thinking like, so you can't really imagine, you know, Peter Sagan leading to what's up a hill you know what I mean yeah like no I, I agree and I think that is one thing the track background gave me it's that um, yeah it's that kind of focus and that numbers based game and that professionalism from an early age um, and I wouldn't say I'd say the, I wouldn't say the team is strict I'd say you have to buy in I think once you kind of start buying in and, and matching you know because you get all the support you need there's, there's no stone unturned so once you start matching that commitment then you start really seeing the results. Um, and I think, yeah, you have to be a certain type of rider to be able to, to operate at that level all year round and, and commit just as much as the team will commit to you. But yeah, for me, like I said, it's this year has been really good in the last year as well. So it's it's a good fit to stay. And just holding on to the team for next season as well, do you reckon we'll see a split strategy for doing that kind of treble? Or do you think they'll split it up a little bit? No, I think they will. I've got no idea which way it will go. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put any money on who will end up where, but... You know, I think for sure everyone's going to, or the, at least Froomey, Bernal and G will all want to do the tour. Um, but yeah, that's Dave's job, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you said, like, uh, you know, we asked you in a previous podcast about who do you aspire to be like within the team. And you always said, like, Luke Rowe, I guess, as being someone that you want to be. You want to be the captain of the team, someone who's calling the shots, someone who gets disqualified after having fights <laughs> with other leaders. Um, <laughs> 
is that is that still an like, ambition of yours? Is that where you see yourself settling into that team? Yeah, for sure. I think uh, you know I've been looking up to Rui for a long time. He's from Cardiff. I'm from Cardiff. Um, is that what makes it? Is it? Well, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. Is uh, I think my parents' house and his parents' house are within a mile of each other. So I grew up. I'm, I think I'm four or five years younger than Rui. So always kind of looking up, looking up to him. Even from a young age when I first started, you know, 13, 14, his dad used to coach me. Um, and that's kind of continued through, you know, getting an academy, seeing what he'd done, made his transition. And then same with the team now. You know, I think he's one of the most valuable riders in the world. Um, obviously races the classics for gas and he's, he's had some great results in that. And he, he's knocking on the door every year and then makes that transition across into almost like your MVP in the tour team. Um, obviously plays that role, ca- road captain role. Um, and yeah, that's the kind of role and the structure to my year I'd like to kind of do. That's an interesting point to dive into because I think a lot of people, you know, watching cycling for the first time kind of don't understand it's a proper team event. And for you to aspire to be someone who's not taking the glory, I guess, you know, one of the proper domestiques, hard workers kind of thing, that that seems like quite an unusual ambition. Do you feel like... I don't want to be too harsh, but do you feel as if you're selling yourself short, saying that you don't want to be someone like a Chris Froome or Bernal or something like that? Uh, I don't think I can go uphill that well. Um, <laughs> no, it, it's getting that balance, I think. You know, I don't want to be a full domestique to the sense that I do it all year round. Um, you know, I enjoy racing bikes and I enjoy trying to win races. But that's kind of the beauty of having the classics as your kind of time in that beginning of the year where you can focus on the races which you care about and you want to do well in. And then making that transition. And to be honest, I get a lot of enjoyment out of helping other lads win bike races. You know, I did the Tour de Suisse with Egan before he went on to win the Tour. And I can never win the Tour de Suisse, but I can help someone else win. And, you know, when you pull in, like there, me and Rowie pulled the two of us for, I think it was 200k. Um, just the two of us when Egan had the jersey. In. And then Egan goes on to win the stage that day. It's like days like that are hard to describe. It It's almost as close as you can get to like a team event on the track, you know, mm. everyone plays their parts. Um, yeah. Okay. Do you feel quite a lot of pressure helping Egan, like in a in a stage race or something? No, or do you feel like I you just have to ride on the front and do my job? Generally, in road racing, I feel no pressure whatsoever. I think, and you can you boys can testify to this probably to the more extreme ex- extent. Once you've done Olympic final, and you've been training for something for four years, and your events less than four minutes, you can't make any mistakes. Otherwise, it's been a waste. And that's even more extreme for you guys in the extent where your event was, what, 42, 43 seconds, something like that? Uh, Phil's was only 17. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Phil's was 17 <laughs> seconds. Four, four years for 17 yeah. seconds. So you can't make any mistakes. No, so, so you, you have, have to get a ride in 17 seconds. So yeah. one mistake and uh, we lose the race. So when you have we? a race which is seven hours, yeah. you can make a few mistakes. And what yeah. is it that brings that pressure down? Is it the fact that you've got a race the week after, the week after, the week after? Because obviously if Phil's got four years to train for 17 seconds, that's a lot of pressure. I, I, mentally, you can't have that intensity all the time. I think the the, the big thing about the games is the build up, isn't it? Mm. And that kind of once you've done it, you've done it. Um, whereas on the road, like yeah, I guess you're racing 70, 80 days a year, so it's kind of going from one to the next to the next. Um, and yeah, you, you yeah, for, for me anyway, I, I don't find it. I don't get too stressed about this kind of stuff. What about when you're the race lead though, like in the in the classics and things like that, when you're given that opportunity to kind of take the team on? Yeah, there, there's more pressure, I guess. Um, but I wouldn't particularly say I get nervous. Again, I don't feel you can get super nervous for a five, six hour event because there's no point stressing about it because anything could, could happen. You, know, you could crash in the first K and break your collarbone. Okay, yeah. And let's, uh, so let's talk about one of the major events for the year for you, which is the Velta Espana. So tell us how it felt to get that call up to your first Grand Tour in one of the most successful teams that the world's ever seen yeah so it was the plan from from pretty much the off the start of the year to be riding it um and that was kind of what i structured my whole second year second half of the year sorry around um after the classics um so i knew for for a little while that i was probably going to be doing it um and yeah i was just i was just proud to be honest was probably the overriding factor um you know it's not an easy thing getting to a grand tour team when you're not specifically a climber in this team it's, it's good that you've were given a bit more notice because we've been out for dinner and drinks before and you'd be like, oh, I might get the call up to do the Giro d'Italia Adel- Adel- yeah. tomorrow or something like that. And then you have to pack your bags and go. Like, how do you how do you manage to deal with that last minute call up? Yeah, I, I've got better at it. I think that's one thing you have to adjust to with uh, professional cycling, especially when you're younger in the team. You know, you're just getting called left, right and centre for races. And it comes back to that track background of being really anal about stuff and just this is your day. You know, before the games, probably similar to, similar to me, we had programs and you knew almost a year in advance what you were doing every single day. And then you were to race on the road and you can be going, thrown left, right and centre. I remember my first year, 
I went to, I started in Australia, got appendicitis there, appendix burst, flew home. Then I got thrown into a race in Abu Dhabi, all the classics. And then I was supposed to just do the cobble classics. And all of a sudden the team said, oh, you've gone okay in these races. We want you to do the Ardennes classics. We did those as well. I was going to do Liège. Um, and then the team said, oh, we need you to go to Romandy now. So I went straight from there to Romandy, finished that. The team said, oh, you know, you've done a great job. Just have, to have a week off, recover, get through it. Um, last day of my break, flying back to Nice, get a phone call. One of the lads got an injury. You have to go to California tomorrow. And it's, it's just kind of that. You just got to be ready to adapt to it. And, and I, you know, that st- kind of stuff would never happen to Froome or G, but it's something you kind of have to go through when you're a Neo Pro. It's kind of classic. And your suitcase is always packed then? Yeah, pretty much. I've, I've literally, when I get home, take the date washing out, clean it, put it back in. You sound like it's going through a pregnancy or something like that. It's like a go bag ready to go. (laughs) Um, So yeah, so the the, obviously the setup for uh, Team Ineos for the Velta was to have like dual leadership between Pals and Teo, Um, and then by the time we got to stage two, that quite quickly became not an option, I guess. (laughs) Um, So they lost about ten minutes in the GC. Um, So what was it like coming back to that bus for your first Grand Tour? And uh, you know, there's probably a few other new faces in there as well, inexperienced faces. you know, how did, how did it feel kind of knowing that basically the thing that you set out to achieve was off the cards from stage two onwards? I wouldn't say we went in with a, a huge expectation of GC for that. It was, you know, we'll play it week by week, day by day and see how it went. And obviously it didn't go very well very early. Um, but, you know, there was no, it wasn't the, the team's heads were down. You know, we went into the race thinking this would be a bonus, but more with the expectation that we everyone would be going for stage wins and having their own opportunities. And that was... It was almost a perfect first Grand Tour for me because the team said from the off, you know, there's no pressure, there's no expectation. We just want to bring you here for the future to develop, to learn. Um, and just when we need you, do your job well. And when you when we don't, take it as easy as possible. So once we didn't even have those GC guys to look after, then my life became a lot easier and it was good. Because <laughs> the first two weeks you were telling me you were actually trying to save yourself a bit because you were expecting to like have a big come down in the third week or... Like have a massive form drop. Yeah, because obviously I've never done a Grand Tour before. So you're kind of going into the unknown. The, so, you know, I didn't, you know, a lot of people have said, oh, they'll always have a bad day in a Grand Tour and one day will be super hard or one day will be manic. Um, and I spoke to a lot of guys and said, oh, you know, if you so always save as much as you can. So for the first the first nine days, I kind of just rode within myself, actually, um, and which worked well because then for the second and the third week, I felt, probably felt better than I did actually in the first week. Did, uh, so it seemed like uh, the Velta, well, it seems in comparison to the Tour, it wasn't actually that chaotic, but it was quite chaotic for like a, a standard uh, Grand Tour. Was that, did you feel like the Movistar influence of the team collapsing and everyone kind of fighting for position and stuff like that kind of played into that unpredictability a bit? Yeah, I th- I, it's, it's hard for me to say because obviously I've never done a Grand Tour, so I can't compare it to anything mm. else. But a lot of guys always said the Velta is one of the most unpredictable races. It can get turned on its head like that. I think a key example was that was, I think, stage 17 with the crosswinds. Um, should have been a straightforward transitional day, 220k, getting from A to B, and it turned out to be the hardest day of the Vuelta for everyone. Well, let's uh, delve into stage 17. So 220k, the longest stage, pretty much? Yeah, longest day of the race. As an average speed of 50k an hour in a breakaway in, uh, in the first 5k. Yeah, it literally went from the car. Which um, you find yourself in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> I wouldn't say it was a breakaway, it's more like a front group, you know, I think everyone wanted to be in that front, um, and I guess that, for me it's one advantage not being a climber, more being a classics rider, that when you're lining up on the start line and maybe 70% of the guys are, are climbers and you've got crosswinds, you're at an advantage straight away, um, but yeah, it was oh, just a manic day, um, yeah, I think we averaged yeah, over 50k an hour for the 220k and it wasn't flat. I think we had two and a half thousand metres of climbing in the stage as well, so it was, we were moving all day and... It's one of those days which, where you're in the front or the last group, everyone was working as hard as each other just to get to the finish. Because he knew it was going to be a hard day because he saw other teams rolling up, uh, warming up on the rollers and stuff like this. And yeah, uh, everyone the, was a bit nervous. That's the thing with pro cycling that nowadays. Everyone's so professional and so on it with weather reports, um, Google Maps, everything. There's no surprises. You know, if you know there's wind from the start, every man and his dog knows that. Even like the, the commentators and the spectators, people are tuning in to watch it specifically. Um, so yeah, a good grid start that they helped. And uh, I want to pull on one of the few bits of controversy from the Velta, because I love controversy. <laughs> um, so in stage 19, you gave Movie Star a bit of a slagging off. <laughs> 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 Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, it was, I don't know if anyone saw it, but it was, should have been, again, pretty straightforward day, um, but it was crosswinds. There was a big crash, 
uh, maybe 50, 60k from the finish, which majority of uh, a lot of jumbo went down. And then maybe two, three K after that, Movistar decided to put the hammer down. Um, and I think, yeah, someone asked me after the finish and oh, yeah, in my eyes, it's not the right thing to do. I think if you've already committed to that effort and you've, or the crash has happened because you're fighting for position or, or it's already going and then there's a crash, that's fair enough. Like the race is on, but the race wasn't on at that stage. Um, and they were trying to exploit someone else's incident. Um, and they were hammering it, and then the, the UCI actually made the decision for some reason, which is against the rules, um, to allow everyone who'd crashed to come back in the cars. So as soon as Movistar heard that, that they knew everyone would be coming back, probably for less energy than they were putting in trying to smash the race, they stopped. Um, so yeah, it was not the easiest this day, but yeah, like, like just classic Buelta, something's happening every day. Have you made amends? I don't know any of the mod stuff. Oh, like, okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I don't speak Spanish either. So, yeah. <laughs> so what, like, on, on the flexion, what's your overall, like, experience of the Velta? So, obviously, like, in terms of heat, distance, climbing, it was probably one of the toughest races that the Velta's ever seen. Yeah, I seen a stat the other day in the last, in the last 20 Grand Tours, th this Velta, this year was the hardest in terms of overall climbing meters, um, which is, afterwards, is something which is quite nice, but beforehand, if you told me that, I wouldn't have been a happy man. Um, but no, I, I'm happy overall. Obviously, with the Worlds this Sunday, hopefully it put me in good stead. Three weeks of of racing around Spain. Um, but yeah, just nice to get a Grand Tour under your belt. I feel once you get that first one, it's kind of the pressure's off a little bit, and then you can kind of you know you can be good and perform in these races, so you can start planning for next year and trying to get into them again. You said to me, um, if you do your first Grand Tour, it can have like a massive impact or it's life changing to do your first Grand Tour? Yeah, I th a lot of guys say physically you kind of step yeah. up a lot. Um, and especially for the classics, you know, you, you see a lot of the classics riders doing the Vuelta um, because it leaves you at the end of the year on such a high level. It's good prep for the world. And then it means when you restart in the start of the year, the form kind of comes back really mm. quickly and you kind of make that progression then in the classics. So um, yeah, hopefully I'll step up again you raced on thursday didn't you with yeah. the gb team how did that go <laughs> <laughs> oh it was not nice um yeah, yeah so b as as the gb team um everyone to be fair sat down at the start of the year and said one thing we want to try and do as a nation is race more together so when we come together for the worlds we're kind of more familiar and, and to be fair most of us already are because you know we're either on academy together or we or we race on ineos together um but it was something we wanted to do so the t the national team put in place a race in belgium at the time Most of us didn't think we'd be doing the Vuelta, which finished on the Sunday. Um, so yeah, we raced yeah four days after the Vuelta, and it's probably the worst possible race you could do. It was it's like a glorified crit in Belgium, basically. And um, <laughs> the three of us who raced the Vuelta did not finish. I, I guess you had <laughs> a no. I guess you had a few uh, tap waters after you completed the Vuelta. Yeah. Just a couple. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, good. Good. Um, so I think like. Uh, how, how do you think you go into the next Grand Tour? Like, is there any kind of preparation you can do for that? Like, so the, for instance, like we, we do run throughs for our event again and again in the track center. We'll do full distance, but is there any way to possibly prepare yourself for Grand Tours? No, I don't think there is, to be honest. Obviously, you can't do a, th a three-week training block. Um, and the most you really train for is three to four days. Um, but I think it's just learning from what you did before, maybe tweaking your weight here and there. Um, yeah, just a few things, nothing major. Okay. Well, I think we all want to see you in a Grand Tour again, and it was pretty nice to have you in there as well. So um, one of the things I want to talk about now is though one of your mates, Chris Lawless, isn't here, um, we're actually seeing the reintroduction of uh, John Dibbon back into the pool yeah. peloton. And uh, used to be called, actually, no, there was a competition between, there was my flatmate, Kian and Maddie, who's now in the Team Pursuit team. We were called uh, Keenan and Cal, basically, which is a play on a TV show, which is on Nickelodeon <laughs> ages ago. Um, but you two were almost seen as, as close. So how is it going to feel to see him lock up at the odd that they see them there? Yeah, I know. I'm looking forward to it. Obviously, he was on Sky for two years um, and then stepped down this year and rode for Madison. Um, but yeah, just great to see him getting another opportunity. You know, he's probably one of the most talented guys I've ever raced with. Um, but he just had a, a bit, he was a bit unlucky last year. You know, in his first year with Sky, he won a World Tour time trial, which, you know, not many guys can do. Um, so yeah, it's great that lot of kind of seen that talent and decided to give him an opportunity to step back up and I'm sure I'll make the most of it. Cool. And uh, so touching on the event that we're here for, the World Championships, how are you feeling and what's your predictions looking into the event on Sunday? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Judging by the last couple of days, it's going to be wet. Um, <laughs> I think that's an inevitability. Um, 
But no, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it, for me, it's going to be my last race of the year before I start my off season. So it's it's a nice opportunity just to kind of get everything else, everything I have left for this year out on the road. Um, obviously, we do, we haven't got a full allocation of riders. Uh, we missed out on the having a full team of eight, and we missed out on it by not much at all. So we only have six. But who's actually there. in the team? We have a pretty classy six, to be honest. Um, so obviously, <laughs> <laughs> except sounds me, like an Anchorman quote. <laughs> <laughs> pretty classy six. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so obviously you've got G, uh, yeah. Adam Yates, myself, Swifty, who will be our team leader, reigning national champ, uh, Ian Stannard, Yogi, and Theo Gagenhart. Okay, cool. So you're fully riding for Swifty? Yeah, Swifty will be our main man. You know, he's got pedigree in the World Champs before. He was fifth in Bergen on a similar-ish course. Obviously being a two-time, um, twice on the podium at Milan San Remo, so you know he can handle the distance. And he loves Grim Day. He's from Yorkshire. He so does love a yeah. good day, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's almost perfect for him. And what's he'll your? Be, he'll what be doing rain dances the night. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your role in the day going to be? Um, so I'll have one of the kind of the early roles, I guess. Um, it will kind of fall to me and and Stan out to protect the guys into the circuit. You know, anyone who's watched the the world champs which have been on so far with the time trials when they've done the laps of Harrogate, you can see how technical and narrow it is. So I think if you're not in the first thirty, you're going to be spending a lot of matches. Um, so yeah, my job will be to to keep the guys in as good a position and save as much energy as for as long as possible. So straight to the pub after a couple of laps, then. Yeah, straight. To the <laughs> pub. Okay, yeah. see you there. <laughs> and uh, so I guess some of these guys are going to be roadside. Um, obviously, when it comes to Chris Laws, who isn't here, um, people would shout Wigan Wagon Wheel, Pig Man. Yeah. Any other nicknames I've missed out here? Uh, What's going to catch your eye? Basically, is what I'm asking. What should uh, these guys shout at the side of the road if they see you flying past? Something in Welsh? To be honest, I, think, <laughs> I ge- no, I genuinely think it's going to be that busy and noisy that you won't be able to pick anything out anyway. Now these are the hardcore, mate. They'll be able to say something. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> tannoy. Um, so, yeah, I guess basically now we're just going to open the floor up to questions. Um, we're, it's going to sound a bit weird, but because we, you guys aren't mic'd up, we're going to... Well, Phil, actually, is going to repeat the question. Am I? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you have any questions for myself, for Duel, or 2016, or GB Cycling, Team Ineos, anything like that, stick your hand up. Can and anything. Love Island. Love Island. Oh, I actually anything. got a... Yeah, i ask the question after. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mate, you're not part of the audience. You can't ask a question now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, would you like well, to ask you your question now? Sit in the, sit in the chair well, I think we forgot the uh, the six days with Cav. Oh yeah, shit, the six yeah. days. Okay, sorry, everyone, <laughs> keep your hands, keep your hands <laughs> primed and loaded. We've got one more question before we move on to that. So, um, so it was on Twitter recently that you and Cav are going to be laid in the six day together as a team. Yeah. Nice little pairing, and I think there's a lot of cycling fans out there who would uh, kind of salivate at the prospect of you two laid in Tokyo together. As uh, as a Madison paling, do you think that's likely, or you keep teasing us a little bit about whether you'll be in Tokyo or not? So uh, it'd be good to clear that up right now. Chances are probably no. Oh, there. <laughs> well, I'll, give the, I'll give you the straight answer. Um, yeah, I think just with how how it is, um, it's going to be really hard to make the the team for Tokyo, just in the sense of the road commitments I have for, for the next couple of years. Obviously, I've signed um, another two years for Ineos and. Obviously, I'm paid to race on the road, so I have to respect that contract. And you would have to ride a World Cup as well this winter? I'd have to, yeah. Well, I'd, yeah. yeah. I guess I'd have to do that. <laughs> yeah. I'd I'd I always feel like Team Ineos have a bit, of a, symp- like a bit of a sympathetic bone to guys who want to do track. So you've seen, like, uh, with the Italian guys, they let someone, uh, Viviani, like, not Viviani. Ghana, yeah. Ghana, yeah, no, laid in there. I think, th- I think they would, but for me, the big focus is the classics next year, and I really want to make that step up and, and be up there in the bigger races. And obviously, that falls in the middle of world champs the world cups so it just doesn't really fit which classic are you targeting just all of them, all of them. i'll take any i'll take yeah. any. <laughs> <laughs> i'm not picky hey, you need to go it through the, about 10 through the cobblestones so. with 17 different frames or whatever <laughs> magnus buckstead told us yeah he told us that the other day didn't he um so now we're going to open the floor up to questions don't be shy ask us anything has anyone got any questions and if you don't i'm really hoping jess has got a question because <laughs> she's the co-host of the event um so yeah has anyone got any questions particularly <laughs> Yes. Oh, thank so God. So <laughs> 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 obviously, being a professional rider, and obviously it is your job to ride, but would you say more of kind of like a corporate career riding for Team Ineos rather than kind of having the opportunities where some of the EF riders have to like live out some dreams doing alternative calendar stuff? Would that be something that you'd be interested to do or would that not be, not be the case? 
Yeah, I'd say I, w- I don't particularly see um, Ryan Frenos as a, a, like a corporate career or anything like that. You know, I don't in my head. I don't really have a job. I just have a hobby which I which I can I get paid for. Um, but in terms of the alternative stuff, yeah, I would love to try and do some of that kind of stuff. But obviously, even if you paid to if you paid a certain amount to race on the road and then you go and do a red hook crit and you break your collarbone, and the team aren't going to be too happy. Um, but you know, it's it's like doing the six day, for example. You know, it's not exactly an alternative race, but different types of racing. Um, yeah, I would like to do something like that in the future. Well, we found the perfect stand-in for Phil the next time he's not available. Yeah. So thank you, sir. It's <laughs> a long um, question to be fair. <laughs> Couldn't remember. Do you feel like learning for Team Ineos is a job? <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, <laughs> any other questions from the floor? Yeah. How do you mentally prepare yourself in like a Grand Tour? Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, okay, that's close enough. Um, you, I think you have to take it day by day. I think if you're, one of the things you get at the start, you get um, obviously the, the whole rope book, which is it's almost like a Bible, it's so thick. Um, and then you get root cards for every single day. And they're about this thick. And you kind of first get, and you kind of can't help yourself flicking through the stages. And one of the older guys said, oh, don't do that. Just literally take it day by day. Um, I think if you're thinking, oh, three days done now, 18 days to go, I think it's a bit daunting. Whereas if you're just thinking, it's another day done, another day done, or maybe three days to the next rest day, then reset. Um, and to be honest, it was something I was kind of a bit worried about thinking mentally, how am I going to cope with doing that? Because, you know, you can do a seven, eight day stage race and you can get to the last day and just be nailed and thinking, well, I don't want to be here. I want to go home. Like, what am I doing here? And it, and it could be tough, but I didn't actually find it too bad in the world. So I think you just get so numb and into such a routine and so tired, I guess, that it's just wake up, have breakfast, get on the bike, ride for five hours, get on the bus, massage, bed. You just kind of get into that routine. And one thing I found actually after finishing, just having this week at home, is I kind of feel a bit lost in what to do. What did you think um, James Knox was think, uh, thinking when he crashed and he had to do another race the day after? Oh, I didn't envy him there. Knoxie, one of the British lads, was sat eighth overall in the Vuelta. Um, and he crashed on the day... Movistar took it up and he was he was a skinned man he was a <laughs> yeah. skinned man he didn't have much left on him um, but to be fair he soldiered on finished 11th in the end yeah on a side note I've actually done a red hook crit oh yeah I forgot about this yeah I got dropped in the f- second lap <laughs> <laughs> really? it's actually really hard yeah so it, if anyone doesn't know it's like it's fixie crit racing so you, you have to uh, weirdly enough it takes a lot of energy to like slow yourself down with your legs I guess but but to, so, yeah, yeah. so to be fair, yeah, she's done a few, haven't you? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so to be fair, I, I remember hearing yeah, about yeah, yeah. this, <laughs> and the story I heard was Rockstar very kindly. Yeah, um, Rockstar Games, the publishers the of, of GTA and all and that kind the, of thing. The, one of the, the sponsor of Red Hook Crit. Yep. flew you and Kiana Mardi over <laughs> to New York to compete in the event. They did, yes. Under the pretext that obviously being track riders and. <laughs> and Olympic champions and European medalists and all this, that you'd actually be quite good at it. But how did, obviously we know how you got on, Kian with the more endurance background, Kian more crashed like, Kian crashed like four times in the qualifying <laughs> race. He crashed in the start. Honestly, I felt so embarrassed because they, they were like, uh, they did this whole promotion and they're like, can you speak to the New York Times? Can you speak to like Washington Post and all this kind of stuff? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were like, oh, how are you feeling about the Red Hook Cut? And I was like, ah, oh, be easy. It'll be fine. <laughs> and then I show up and then all of a sudden, like the boss of Rockstar Games, like one of the two brothers who founded it is in the, is in the hospitality zone at the end. And I'm just standing there with a beer and a jeans and a t-shirt. And he's like, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> like, Sorry. <laughs> I've really enjoyed the hospitality though. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's go for two more questions if we if we have two more questions. Yeah, sure. We're hearing a lot about uh, nutrition being really important. How much impact does it have on your performance and how controlled is your diet when you're That was a question for Phil, I think. That, the Coco Pot Master. Um, well how, I guess how, what did you eat leading up to the Olympics? Let, let me explain first. <laughs> <laughs> I think for track sprinters, um, the nutrition isn't as important as for the road guards. We have just need to have a lot of protein um, and Nutella. just have, have our power to weight ratio <laughs> needs to be decent. Cocoa pops. Um, well, I think for the road guys, they need to be as light as possible and yeah, as lean you can as possible. Be cocoa just, pops just, anyway. like, yeah, that's, just like Phil's repeated the questions here, can you actually repeat <laughs> what Phil should have said? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm following our boat to though with the Cocoa Pops. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be fair, I think that my favorite nutritional approach I've ever heard is the Ed Clancy diet. Oh, Ed. what, where he actually got goats because his diet was so bad? 
<laughs> no one's had that since Ed, the Victorian era. I don't know what he's doing. Ed, Ed knows what he wants. He knows what he sticks to. And he's always knuck, uh, bumping heads with the GB nutritionist. They're trying to get him to do a different diet, try this. But he knows what wins him Olympic Games. And that is Coke, Pringles, <laughs> and dairy milk. That's, that's, if you ever watch the London Olympics, the Omnium, over the two-day event, if you, if you happen to peek into the track and you can see Ed in the track centre, those are the only things to be eating. Not gels, not rice cakes, just those. And he actually turns up to every single track session with two litres of Coke <laughs> and drinks it. This is what, that's this like, is secret. That's like three times. Yeah. Four, five. Five. Let's go to a professional rider. What do you have? On the, on the road side of stuff, no, you can't get away with that. Um... And yeah, the, the diet is very controlled and especially for the Grand Tour stuff when you're kind of, you're looking for those little one percenters and, and every difference, everything can make a, every small thing can make a big difference. Um, we're really fortunate again with Ineos that we have a, a whole kitchen truck. So it travels from stage to stage with us. Um, and it's basically a truck which kind of expands out and inside we have a dining room. The chefs can cook in there and everything's plated out. Um, if you want, they can plate it out to exactly the right amount of carbs and protein for you or you can just freestyle it i go for the freestyle option um <laughs> well but, I, so how does that feel a little bit so like I, I always think that if i was at the olympic games and i said to the swan year i mean this sounds a bit prima donna ish but stick with me um if i said to swan year like i need a packet of Halibo or mcdonald's otherwise i won't win the olympic medal like you should you should kind of have it because you know your body best yourself like how is freestyle still the way that you go or, or is it when it comes to a Grand Tour you realise that you have to look at the longer picture? No, I think you have to look at the longer picture, especially in a Grand Tour and that was one of the things I was a little bit concerned about is is it's normal if you do a race to put on, say, a kilo over the space of a seven, eight day race. So if you're doing three weeks, you could put on three kilos. Um, so it's just getting that, that weight balance right. You know, obviously eating enough that you can still perform and get the best out yourself but not overeating. Um, and that's where the whole team and the sports staff there come in. You know, obviously they'll check the Garmin files, check how hard a day you've had, work out how much you actually really need to refuel afterwards. And to be fair, it's, it's not like if someone said, oh, this is, this is the day this has been, here's your food, and I finished and I was still hungry. I'd eat more. Because, mm. I, you know, it's, it's getting that balance of listening yeah, to your I wouldn't say that because well. I visited you guys at Altitudes in Isola. So they had been up there for like three weeks and it was honestly like stepping into some like Antarctic research laboratory where they'd not seen <laughs> humans in like 10 years. And I see, I see like a few of you guys like taking like a single oat out of the scale and putting it back <laughs> it in the packet because you're like, oh, that's a bit over. It wasn't <laughs> that extreme. No, I, I, I think it's different again with training. You know, obviously you, to lose weight, you have to be in a calorie deficit. So you have to under fuel to an extent but it's that's a good tip for you phil there you go yeah thanks i don't need to be in a calorie deficit <laughs> <laughs> i don't think you've um, ever been in a calorie deficit <laughs> maybe <laughs> so uh we'll go for a final question from the floor Fino yeah sure oh we might have two actually yeah okay on you go <laughs> so phil we'll just repeat the question so, oh, yeah. <laughs> do you get flashbacks of the final up in the team pursuit in rio Oh, that's a great question. I get flashbacks. <laughs> I get. Um, I don't know how you dealt with that stress. I was no. looking at that on the TV, thinking, "Oh my god." I I can't actually remember it, to be honest. But tell you what prepared me for that was. Do you remember we had the we had the European champs in Guadeloupe? Mm. Um, maybe in the Caribbean, in the by the Caribbean, way. Caribbean, yeah. Yeah, makes perfect French, it's a French territory. Makes so that's perfect how they got sense. It. it was yeah. <laughs> it was a good European champs. Oh, it was awesome. Um, yeah, jet skis and everything. But I, 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 a similar scenario actually happened in that. In the, we were in the European team pursuit final against Germany and outdoor track, someone had called three. I swung off thinking I was done again. And again, two guys left. So we just about won that one. But I guess because it happened before, it was kind of maybe ingrained a bit and it just autopilot kicked in. But no, I, I can't remember a thing about it. I can just remember crossing the line and looking up the scoreboard. That's about it. Can you guys remember yours? Can I remember mine? Yeah. I just remember thinking how fresh Phil looked and how fucked I was, basically. <laughs> <laughs> you sat in that gate thinking, please, Phil, go slow, go slow, go slow. Go slow. <laughs> no, it all came together somehow. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm still kind of scratching my head as to why now. Um, Jess, have you got a final question? Oh, yeah. Road race predictions, do I? Thank you, Philip. That was very proficient. <laughs> <laughs> he's getting the hang of it now, yeah. isn't he? He's so, he's so I'm well prepared trained. now. <laughs> <laughs> he's better at the short ones as well. Isn't yeah. He? <laughs> <laughs> Um, do, you want to, do you want to go first, Phil? Um, I have to go Swifty. 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 <laughs> yeah. And, and women's prediction? Women's prediction. <laughs> you, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd, I'd like to see Lizzie win. I think that'd be awesome yeah. to like win a home, like actually home world championships, like Yorkshire Girl, Yorkshire Race. That would be awesome. 
To be fair, I think if Swifty makes a top five, I think that would be a huge achievement. You were saying he's going to win a second ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so who, who's your pick it's for the win though? Pressure, give, isn't give it? another two seconds. He's going to be in the top 10. <laughs> Can we get Richard Mullen for a second? <laughs> 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 so no, I think, um, yeah, for the women's, I think hopefully Lizzie does really well. Um, I think it's a good course for her. And from what I've heard, she's kind of built a whole year around this. I think Voss is going to be really good as well. Um, and the Dutch team in general. So either a Dutch rider or Lizzie. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, and the men's is, again, another really open one. I think the course, how it is, and the nature of it, it could be so hard that it could favour someone like Valverde. It wouldn't surprise him if he won again. But it might not be hard enough for him in terms of, you know, climbing and, and how it's raced that someone like Sagan could win. But I think it falls bob in the middle for someone like Philippe. to be honest. I think he's, mm. he's going to be really good there. Swifty, I think, will also be really good. Similar to Lizzie, he's tailored most of the second half of his year around being good for this day. Um, so I got full confidence in him. And as the world, well. uh, Van der Poel. Van der Poel, that's another one, yeah, I think him. But I, I think the guy who's going to win is Gilbert. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, <so> <laughs> <laughs> Unless there's any final burning questions. No, so we're going to wrap up this podcast. Thank you very much to Undo coming on. I'm just going to do a quick commercial bit before we hopefully get a round of applause. <laughs> so this way everyone gets to laugh at me again. So we have a World Championships pop-up, which is down by the Prince of Wales Landabout. So you can pop down any time and get a free coffee and chat to Philip Hines. Um, so the coffee is provided by North Star. Those two are based in, based in Leeds and the coffee machine is provided by Lar Mazoku, which Phil has at home and thinks is wonderful. It's great, yeah. Yeah, good. Bye, and um, <laughs> and uh, I'd also like to say that you can, uh, one of our main partners is Temper. So if you enter Cycling 100 into www.temper.co.uk, you can get £100 off a new mattress. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so that concludes the podcast. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming down. This is the first time we've ever done a kind of live podcast. We might do a few more in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>